thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, earth. or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul. Whatever thou be, until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello, Lindsay. Hello, sir. Uh, Lindsay has a uh, a quick announcement, and then I think oh, right we're, into it. Yeah, we're off into it. Okay, well, guys, this weekend is the weekend. You've been hearing us talk about summer camp for three weeks now. This or this is the third announcement. So this Saturday, March twenty third, ten a.m. Pacific time. Make sure you're watching your clocks if you're not in the Pacific time zone. My God, that's hard to say. Uh, you can head on over to badmagicproductions.com, click the summer camp uh banner, and it will link you over to another spot where you'll click and it'll take you to tickets. Bada bing, bada boom, bada bang. First come, first serve. <laughs> we'll see you there next year. Awesome. Perfect. Um, and how many stories do you have today? I have my two uh, usually uh, told tales. Uh, my first tale is, <laughs> it's a very like odd tale, very different for me on this side. It's about like fae folklore or fairies, uh, a possible encounter uh, while hiking. And then my second story, as we've seen these many times before, imaginary friends. But what I love about this imaginary friend is at the end, we get a very interesting detail that's like, oh, okay. Ties it all together very nicely. A little bow on top. Okay, very cool. Uh, I also have my standard two. The first, an, anon- an anonymously posted and spooky as hell alien abduction claim. Oh, no. I uh, hope it creeps you out as much as I love it. Not sure where it takes place, but seems to be based on slang, feel of the characters uh, set in America. And then my second story, uh, set in your hometown, Cleveland, Ohio. Whoop, whoop. Finally going to talk about the Franklin Castle. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, be- I believe your dad drove you and I by Franklin Castle during one of our last visits and told us about you know, how haunted it is. I, I remember him I remember yeah. him pointing it out and being like, oh, you got to do a story about this place. Yeah, maybe, because I think also Jim Harold, who is from Cleveland and tells mm. an incredible podcast if you're looking for some more spoopy stuff and just an all-around really great human. We've connected with him many times. Uh, I What's wanna, the name of his podcast? Uh, Jim Harold's Campfire Tales. Okay, great. And I think that there are some subsidiaries within. Yeah, um, a little family of podcasts. Yeah, but I think that they're all his. You Mm -hmm. know, it's so funny we say this, but it's like when you get into your wormhole of your content, it's so hard to zoom out and think about like what other people are creating. Yeah. Uh, But creators do often connect and we've connected with Jim over the years. But I want to say that Jim has covered the Franklin Castle because I think that my dad's whole thing was like, and you should talk to Jim Harold. And I was like, yes, dad, (laughs) we know Jim Harold. He just like, he, my dad is really big on like telling people what they should do. Uh-huh. He loves it. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so those are my two stories. And then once you've shown this week's spoopy socks, I'll just jump right into the first one. Still not allowed to put my leg up on the desk. So I have one of these socks on. I'll bend over and put this other one on. It's so funny. A shitting rainbows kind <laughs> of day. <laughs> this little like chick, chickity shitting rainbows. That sounds like a good day. Yeah. I yeah. imagine, you know, if you're shitting rainbows, things are going pretty well, I would think. I think or, or is it sarcastic? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, so no setup uh, for this first tale. Just going to dive right in. Time now for the tale of abandoned or abducted. When my dad went missing, I told the police he'd been acting strangely. They asked me to elaborate. I couldn't. Not right away. I guess um he's been saying all this odd stuff, like real odd stuff. Stuff he hadn't talked about before. He talked about someone, or I guess a couple of someones, coming after him. I trailed off. So your father had some enemies, people that might want to hurt him, one of the police officers asked me. He was a tall one of the two. For the sake of the old guy's privacy, I'll change his name. I guess I'll be changing everyone's name in this story because I don't want anyone coming after me either. We'll call the tall officer, Officer Harold. I could tell Officer Harold was trying his best to be kind to the, to be kind to the scared 14-year-old sitting in front of him. I could tell he was trying to make me feel heard, trying to convince me with all his note-taking and head-nodding that what I said was useful and that they were going to put all this effort into finding my dad. His partner did not offer the same courtesy. While Officer Harold sat patiently with me at the two-seater kitchen table with his understanding look plastered on his face, his partner, who I'll call 
Officer Smith paced back and forth, surveying the interior of our mobile home. While Officer Harold had the decency to feign concern, Officer Smith only looked irritated, judgmental, like this whole thing was a waste of his time. Driving the long road up to the trailer park in the mountains from the nice, comfy suburban world he hailed from. While Officer Harold wrote down what I said, Officer Smith was taking mental notes on the dingy carpet and the stack of unwashed dishes and the three Red Bulls on the counter as evidence that my dad did what all the dads around here were prone to do. Up and leave. Ditched us. Got sick and tired of his wife nagging him to stop his drinking and his daughter pleading with him to get a job and he just fucked right off. Honestly, I don't blame Officer Smith. It's what my mama, who was smoking a cigarette outside with our neighbor Sally while I was getting interviewed, believed. It's what damn near everyone in the trailer park believed. It's what I would have believed if I hadn't seen it. If I didn't know in my gut that my dad did not just take a bus out of town and that he wasn't lying dead in a ditch somewhere, blood seeping out of his cracked skull where some so-called drinking buddy of his had bashed his head in with a beer bottle. My dad was a bastard. And honestly, my mom and I are better off without him. He lied to her more times than I can count about this job or that. He lied to me about what happened to my college fund, and he almost never came home without reeking of alcohol. But damn it, my dad loved us. I know he did. And I know he didn't just up and go. He was taken. Officer Harold asked me how long my dad had been acting strangely. Again, I was at a loss for words. Um, well, I looked out the musty window at my mom facing away from the trailer. Even from behind, you could tell she was beautiful, just beaten down by years of suffering her lot in life. She was wearing a hot pink tank top and long baggy jeans, her cigarette dangling lazily in her left hand. She was staring out into the woods. I looked next to her and saw Sally. She was facing the trailer, staring at me blankly, standing oddly erect, with her arms glued to her sides. Her mouth was open like a Venus flytrap, waiting for some poor insect to leisurely land inside its big mouth. Sally was older than my mom by 10 or 15 years, but acted like she was 21. She always had her saggy, sweaty cleavage hanging out of whatever leopard print shirt she was wearing and always had nice things to say about everybody. She was more of an aunt than a friend. She was always there with a bowl of spaghetti or some cereal in the morning before school if my mom was at work and my dad was nowhere to be seen. I felt safe around Sally. But in that moment, her peculiar stare sent shivers down my spine. Officer Harold snapped me out of my trance by politely coughing. He was waiting for me to answer this he was waiting for me to answer his question. How long had my dad been acting strange? I didn't know what to say, because really my dad has always been strange. Ever since I was a kid, even before the alcohol made him practically incoherent much of the time, he loved telling tall tales. Growing up, it was a long time before I knew the difference between fact and fiction, and not just for the normal stuff like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. I grew up knowing full well that the woods surrounding our trailer park were inhabited by gremlins that had a taste for soft flesh of children, and tall trees that would tell you how you die if, to plant, if you planted the right flowers around the roots. I fully believed in monsters of unimaginable size and millions of eyeballs, and vampires and werewolves, and a bunch of other creepy things that go bump in the night. I knew all this to be true because my dad told me as much. He told me over and over and over again, me and all the other kids in the park. He had a wild imagination, and honestly, I think that was part of the reason he started drinking in the first place. The world was too boring for him. He needed to escape. Finally, I met Officer Harold's eyes. Um, I guess about three or four months ago was when he started acting really weird. I mean, weirder than normal. Officer Smith snorted. I ignored him. Can you tell me a little more, said Harold. I nodded. That was when he started talking about these, uh, these things he saw on his way home from the lumber yard or the bar down the road i wrung my hands and looked up at smith the officer's face was so transparent i felt like i could almost read his mind he must have been thinking something like give it up kid your daddy's not coming home he was a drunk and a fool and a cheat and an asshole and he left you you and your mom for some reason his condescending credulousness hardened my resolve to keep going i had to prove him wrong he started talking about eyes watching him, about, about people that weren't people stalking him. He kept saying that they were waiting for him. Harold interjected. Where, um, where did your dad say he saw these people? Everywhere, I continued. He said they were everywhere. He said that they were the drivers in the cars that pulled up next to him at stoplights. He said that they were, were the other shoppers at the grocery store. He said they never blinked, never said a word. They just stared at him. He said that they, they wanted him. Another snort from Smith. 
No, I said, not like that. They didn't want him in any of the ways you think. He said they wanted to, to use him, to, um, learn. They both just stared at me blankly, Smith looking semi-amused. I didn't know how to proceed, how to tell them what I saw the other night, how to tell them that I think he was right about the people that weren't people, and the eyes, and the waiting. Suddenly, Smith made his way over to me and knelt down so he was at my eye level. And what kid did these people that weren't people, that don't blink and don't say nothing, want to learn from your old man, huh? Face to face with someone I knew would never believe me, who thought that they were better than me, my courage started to falter. Without looking away, I shakily told him the truth. They wanted to learn about us, about you and me, our insides, our guts, our, our veins and our hearts and our brains and our souls. Smith stood up and slapped his hands on his knees, exasperated. In that moment, I thought, fuck it. It's a lost cause anyway. These guys, are, these guys aren't going to help me. I've got nothing to lose. And I told them everything. About a month ago, he told me right here at this table that he knew what these people that weren't people, these, these people-shaped beings wanted from him. He told me they wanted to split him open from sternum to pelvis and take out each of his organs and hold them in their bare hands, these squishy, oozing balls of meat. They wanted to smell the organs, to taste them, to mold them into things anew. They, they wanted to smear them across white tables to see what spilled out. And, and, and while they did all this, they wanted to keep him alive. They wanted to peel back each layer of his old skin without it tearing, like when somebody peels an old orange whole. They wanted to stretch his blanket of skin and see how it looked under fluorescent lights and, and rub it between their fingers and wrap it all around their frail shoulders to see what it felt like to be human. They wanted to pluck each of his little microorganisms out that burrow into his skin and on his eyelashes and in his hair and introduce themselves so they could ask them what all the fuss about their human host was for. They wanted to scoop out his eyeballs and run them under some cold water to see if his memories would wash down the drain. They wanted to drill his skull open ever so carefully and spoon out his brain so they could trace their spindly fingers along each crevice to see where it led them. They wanted to rake something like a cheese grater against his spongy, withering brain till it was shredded into long, gooey strips of matter they could slurp up like spaghetti. They wanted to feel his thoughts, writhe around like worms inside their own insides. They wanted his ribbons of brain to crawl up and wrap around their own bones like vines along a tree so they could experience the embrace of human connection. They wanted to yank out his esophagus and, and peer through it like a pirate looking through a spyglass. They wanted to carve out a small hole in their own stomach and stitch it one end of the, to one end of the esophagus. They wanted to then pour their own nutrients through the mucousy straw like a makeshift umbilical cord to see what it was like to live within a human mother's womb. They wanted to slice his tongue out and place it on their own and let it dissolve like cotton candy. They wanted to feel how the shape of human words fit into their mouths. They wanted to pry off his toenails and stack them in neat rows and make pretty things out of his tiniest bones and saw off his ears and so on to their own so they could hear what he heard when he was first born into this world of men. They wanted to observe him, skinless, uh, excavated, hollow and wet, exposed and strapped down and contemplate if, without a brain, without a tongue or eyes, without ears, without a heart or a liver or an esophagus without any of the recognizable physical traits of the human species he could still be categorized as human they wanted to know what makes us human and they were going to use my dad to do it officer harold took a breath like he was about to say something but i interrupted i wasn't done with him yet but they also wanted to know something else i said looking deep into harold's eyes any semblance of concern or pity was gone he was horrified I turned to face Officer Smith. His demeanor of smugness dissipated. Now he just looked angry. Do you want to know what else they were looking for, Officer? I said. His eyes darkened. And what was that? They wanted to know where we keep our soul. I, uh, I think we're done here, said Officer Harold, and they began packing up their things. Well, uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you know what leads we find regarding your father, unfortunately, given his history and the fact that he's a 57-year-old grown man. It is most likely that he departed on his own free will, but we will continue treating his absence as a missing persons case until we can prove otherwise. You, uh, you let us know if he contacts you, okay? I nodded and wished them a good afternoon. I wanted to tell them more, but what was the point? And they were already leaving. I wanted to tell them how a week ago I was working at the kitchen table doing homework around 11 p.m. when I saw my dad pull up in a Chevy. It was nighttime, but the moon was shining in all its glory, illuminating the trailer park in a dull gray light. I wanted to tell them how he tumbled out of the car and started walking unsteadily towards the door, clearly drunk. How I sighed and braced myself for a deluge of apologies and the odor of vodka to fill the room. I wanted them to know how, as I watched from the kitchen window, my dad suddenly stopped in his tracks in front of the little metal staircase that led up to the front door and stood straight up like a hound dog that catches a whiff of prey. I wanted to tell them how his jaw abruptly fell open 
and a painful moan escaped from it. I wanted to tell them how scared I was, how I ran to the door and swung it open frantically saying, Dad, Dad, are you okay? I wanted to tell them how he was unfazed by the sudden movement, how he didn't even flinch when I stepped outside, how there wasn't even a flicker of recognition that anything or anyone was around him in his eyes. He just kept staring straight ahead, staring into something beyond. And the sound emitting from his open mouth, that horrifying moan, I wanted to tell them how he never once paused for a breath. I wanted to tell them that only when I grabbed his arms and started shaking him did his mouth slam shut. But he still didn't look at me. Instead, his head slowly turned to the right, towards the woods. I wanted to tell them how he stepped free of my grasp, and I let him. I didn't know what else to do. I wanted to tell them how he started marching with purpose towards the thick forest and how in a moment of silence between my sobs and pleas for him to turn around, I heard something. That same groan, monotone, unwavering, forceful, coming from the part of the woods where my dad was headed. I broke into a sprint after him. I wanted to tell them how I desperately grasped at his shirt sleeves and wrapped my arms around his waist and planted my feet in the dirt to keep him from going in there and how he shrugged me off like he might swat a fly away from your face. I wanted to tell them how I started screaming at him to just for once listen to me, to come home, to get inside where it's safe, how I fell to my knees because somehow I knew that I was never going to see him again. I wanted to tell them that as I watched my dad disappear into the trees through tears and fog, I made out something else in front of him, the person or thing he was walking towards. They were tall, unfathomably tall. Their arms hung well past their knees, their neck stretched high and their skull was slender and thin. I wanted to tell them how the tall man reached its arms towards my dad's face and clamped its hands briskly on either side of its head, of his head. A moment later, my dad crumpled to the ground and landed with a sickening thud. Terrified, I staggered to my feet and ran as fast as I could to the trailer. With quivering hands, I locked the door and hurtled towards the kitchen table where I could see the woods from the window. I wanted to tell the officers how I stood there, breathing hard and staring wildly into the dark night, waiting for my dad to emerge from the thick foliage with whatever that thing was in pursuit. I readied myself to unlock to the door and let him inside where he'd be safe, but he never came. I waited and waited and waited and searched for any sign of him, but there was nothing, only the silent woods. And then suddenly, there was a light, so much light. Not the moon's pale glow, but a head-splitting white brilliance, so bright that for for a moment, the whole of the trailer park looked like it had been struck by fierce lightning, and then darkness. I wanted to tell the officers how in that dark I saw something flash unnaturally across the night sky and how in that instant I knew with all my heart that whatever it was, my dad was inside it. And wherever it was going, he was going to as well. And he was never coming back. And now, Sally's gone. They must have come back for her. Who will they take next? And when will anybody really start to care? I mean, what if everybody in that trailer park just goes poof? Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, at some point, you would think that the authorities would think, like, something strange is going on here. Like, they would start to think, like, serial killer or, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, ugh. I did, I wondered about Sally. As soon as you were talking about the part where the dad is, like, coming to the house and then he Mm -hmm. stands very straight. Very straight, mouth mouth open. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, "Oh, oh, Sally, Mm -hmm. you're next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is why I'm afraid of aliens. Not not because I mean, yes, like fear of the unknown, but like fear that they will come and abduct us and torture us. Mm-hmm. Just like just like uh just inquisitively. Well, like, yeah. like not not with mm-hmm. the intention of torturing the way that like uh you know like a serial killer or something. Exactly, but just like a, the like a way scientist. That, yeah, or like the way that like a little kid will like get a, a doll yeah. and just rip its arms off because yep, they're just curious, bug. like what's inside of it. Didn't Monroe recently just tell us that she used to eat roly polies? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think. God, Why was were it we her talking or about was that? It my sister Donna. Well, Some, somebody when they were a little kid. Maybe Eleanor it was ate spiders. Eleanor ate spiders. I ate worms. God. And then Monroe might have eaten roly polies. Yeah. I ate no bugs, just to be clear. <laughs> no bugs for you. No thanks. I know, but yeah, that's what it reminded me of too. Just like, yeah, they just want to know like what we're made of, what what makes us work. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then, yeah, just like we would uh, dissect a frog in a, totally. in a class. Oh, it's man. like, they would just do that to us. Did you dissect frog in high school? I did. I uh, oh, it was so gross. Yeah, I barely remember it. Oh, I remember it. Oh, poor of Miss McNamara. Uh, I, I do remember um, 
making my little frog talk. Yep, that seems right. Uh huh. I hated you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have pictures? I, 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 bleh, 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 bleh. Do you have pictures that accompany this story? I can't speak today. <laughs> I do. Uh, this first one is the photo of the woods just outside the trailer park. Oh, okay. And then this next one, uh, a picture of the edge of the trailer park, beginning of the woods. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then this next one, a stock image of a man approaching an alien in the woods, excuse me, that seems to fit this story pretty well. That's a big alien. Yeah, that's just like, well, I feel like that's like a, a flashlight situation where like the light from yeah. behind it is making the, sh- you're seeing the shadow and it looks bigger. He has five fingers, which is, I feel like atypical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's just uh, some, one of those uh, stock photo sites you can grab photos off of. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think about this story? Uh, I, I liked it. I liked the way it was told. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, just, I mean, you know, it's, it is a, a, you know, a lot of these alien abduction stories are fairly similar, but I, mm-hmm. I like the details added of what this very imaginative guy yeah. suspected these things were going to do to him mm-hmm. before they took him. Mm-hmm. And who knows how much of that was just in his head, you know, sure. and who knows if all the people he was seeing supposedly watching him were really connected to his abduction. Yeah. But maybe I really like the deed. Like if there wasn't the detail of her seeing him go into the woods seeing that weird flash of light, seeing some other being that didn't look quite human out there, then I would just think he was nuts. Mm. You know, just a guy who drank himself to a certain level of insanity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I liked it. What about you? Yeah, it was good. It's good. I mean, aliens always freak me out. And Mm -hmm. I was already like, I was making a note. I was like, oh, I should look into this. Like I was having thoughts. I was like, no, you shouldn't. Don't don't look further. (laughs) Don't make it worse, Lindsay. Get it out of your head. Quick, erase it. Erase it, erase it. It's gone. Uh, you had enough of hearing about aliens? You want to tear us apart, examine our guts? Take me home. Quite a bit of history to go over here. Uh, Interesting history, I think, in Cleveland, before we make it to the paranormal portion of the story. Uh, Franklin Castle is an infamous Victorian mansion located at 4308 Franklin Boulevard in the Ohio City neighborhood of Cleveland, Ohio. It's been a fixture there for well over a century. Originally called Tiedemann House, it was built between 1881 and 1883 and owned by Johannes Tiedemann, a German immigrant who'd made a fortune as a wholesale grocer and banker. Tiedemann was the co-founder of the Union Bank and Savings Company in Cleveland. Tiedemann selected Franklin Boulevard as a street to build his opulent residence off of because it was one of the wealthiest residential areas in the city when construction began. By the late 19th century, Germans constituted the largest ethnic group in the city, and many of them had become part of the middle and upper middle classes. I'm part German. Yep. (laughs) Uh, Johannes, who went by Hannes Tiedemann, was born April 12, 1832, in a small village in Germany. He and his family boarded a ship, sailed to the United States in early May of 1848, arriving in New York City later that same month. Seven years later, in 1855, Hannes relocated to Cleveland. In 1862, he returned to Germany, where he married uh, Louise Huck on March 9th. They returned to the U.S. four days later. And like many people of that era, the young family's lives would be marked by quite a bit of tragedy. Their first child, Wilhelmina, don't hear that name every day. Wilhelmina? Wilhelmina. With a V, oh. Uh, I think that maybe it's pronounced with W, but I think in German, like they would like pronounce it more like a V. Uh, So the first child, uh, yeah, Wilhelmina or Wilhelmina, born in June of 1863, never saw her first birthday. She became sick and died of tuberculosis August 10th. Hannes and Louise's second child, uh, a son, August, Johannes, was born on September 28, 1864. Their third child, a daughter, Emma, was born in November of 1865. That same year, Hannes purchased a large residence called Bachelor's Hall from a man named Alonzo Wolverton. The Wolvertons were four brothers from Canada who had moved to Cleveland to further their education, and they built Bachelor's Hall in 1860. Sadly, only two of the brothers would survive the American Civil War. The Tiedemann family moved into the lavish Bachelor's Hall mansion, and Hannes generously offered their home as a place for his friends and family to stay upon their arrival from Germany. Hannes and Louise's fourth child, their son Ernst Tiedemann, born in December of 1869, and like their first child, also would not see his first birthday. He died of meningitis July 19, 1870. Their fifth child, daughter Dora Louise, born the following spring, May 29, 1871, and their last child, son Albert, was born in the spring of 1873 and yet again would not live to see his first birthday. He got sick and died a few months later on July 8th. August, Emma, and Dora were the only children who would survive past infancy, and they grew up in Bachelor's Hall during the 1870s. 
Tragedy would once again strike the family in 1881, the year the construction began on the Franklin Castle. That year, Hannes' mother, Vibeka, and the couple's 15-year-old Emma both died inside the Bachelor's Hall mansion. Vibeka died of unspecified natural causes, and it is believed that Emma died from complications of diabetes. The family now decided that they needed to leave the mansion, site of too much death, and start over somewhere else new. They moved into a large summer home they'd purchased in what is now the Cleveland neighborhood of Lakewood. This was where Hannes first got the idea to build a new home on the site of Bachelors Hall. Hannes employed the architectural firm of Cuddle and Richardson to build the magnificent Franklin Castle, a four-story mansion with a grand ballroom and a carriage house. Work was again completed in 1883. Louise coped with the loss of her children by focusing on designing the home. She had the children's faces carved in stone near the front entrance to honor their memories. Hannes and Louise also had hidden rooms and secret passages added to the mansion. No one seems to know for sure why these passages uh, were built, and it's led to a lot of speculation about their true purpose. Some believe that these rooms were used by Tiedemann to commit heinous crimes. With all the deaths surrounding him, rumors have floated around that Hannes was secretly a violent, controlling man, that not everyone in his family had died of illness, as publicly claimed. Hannes was accused of killing his mother, his oh. daughter Emma, his niece, a mistress, and an illegitimate daughter. Jesus. Hannah's mistress was reportedly a servant girl named Rachel. Eventually, another man captured her attention, and she moved on from Hannah's. And it has been said that on the day of her wedding, Hannah's demanded she romantically return to him. Rachel refused Hannah's advances, and he strangled her in one of the secret passages, then staged the murder to look like she had hanged herself. Another story claims that Hannah's once caught his niece Karen in bed with his grandson and shot her in a fit of rage. Once again, he supposedly staged her death to look like a suicide. Did any of that actually happen? The majority of people consider these rumors to be nothing more than baseless, sensational gossip. Hannes was known for his generosity as a benefactor of the community. Some believe his wife Louise commissioned the secret tunnels to sneak around the mansion without her husband's knowledge. Louise Tiedemann died of liver disease in March of 1895 inside the walls of Franklin Castle, or her husband killed her. Once again, talk circulated that blamed Hannes for her death. The fact that he quickly remarried the year following her death in 1896 did not help stop the spread of these rumors. His new wife was a young waitress from Germany named Henriette. And in 1897, Hannes and Henriette moved out of Franklin Castle and into his Lakewood summer home mansion. But the marriage didn't last. The pair parted ways for reasons never made public knowledge, it seems, and Hannes was soon alone. And he would live alone for quite some time. Hannes Tiedemann would outlive all of his children. His last two children, Dora and August, both died in 1906. August died from, from arteriosclerosis, a vascular disease. Dora died of an infection after she fell down the stairs and fractured her hip. So much death in the Hannes family. Hannes would sell Franklin Castle to a local brewer in his final years and then die of a stroke in 1908 at the age of 75. Following his passing, there would be at least one more mysterious death in the family, that of his grandson, Carl Hans Tiedemann, on December 16, 1929, 39-year-old Carl jumped off a bridge immediately after a minor car accident. His death was ruled a suicide. As reported by the Akron Beacon Journal on December 17, 1929, after he had told two men with whose automobiles his car had collided that their damages would be taken care of, Carl H. Tiedemann, 40, leaped to his death from the Clark Avenue Bridge yesterday. Relatives were unable to account for his act. Some sources say 39 years old, some sources say 40. Uh, one article from the time reported that Carl was suffering from peculiar nervous tension for months before his death. Back to Franklin Castle, the lavish residence would go on to have multiple owners during the 20th century. The Brewer's family soon sold a house in 1915 to Dr. Ulysses Sherman, Leroy Shirky, who lived there with his family until 1921. In 1921, the Shirkies sold the mansion to the Taylor Wag Company. They named it Eintracht Hall, and it became the Cleveland home of the German-American League for Culture. It started off as a cultural organization that was involved in politics and then later became a German singing club. And soon thereafter, it would become mostly known for supposedly being very haunted. Time now for the tale of the ghosts of Franklin Castle. By the 1960s, stories had been circulating for years that the house was haunted by the spirits of Emma and Louise Tiedemann, both of whom died in the house. And then in 1968, the house was sold to the Romano family, and they would make many of the first paranormal claims that would become documented in historical lore. 
On the day they moved in, two of their children came down from the third floor and asked Mrs. Romano if they could bring a cookie to their new friend. They described her as a little girl in white who was crying. Mrs. Romano could find no such girl in the house. Her children would swear they weren't making it up and seemed quite shaken by the experience. After a few more sightings of this little girl, who the family came to believe was the ghost of Emma Tiedemann, sightings that increasingly upset her kids, Mrs. Romano forbade her children from playing on the third and fourth floors entirely. And then Mrs. Romano began to see strange and unexplainable things herself. The Romanos would report witnessing objects moving on their own, voices in empty rooms, and footsteps on the ballroom floor. Two of Mrs. Romano's adult sons, still living at home, once even had the blankets ripped off of them while they slept. And more than just a little frightened, the boys moved out the very next day. Mrs. Romano herself claimed she once saw a woman wearing a black funeral gown in the third floor of the home's turret. She believed that she saw the spirit of Louise Tiedemann. Others speculated she had seen the ghost of Vibeka, Hans's mother, or Rachel, his supposed mistress, or his niece, Karen. Allegedly, shortly after the sighting of the woman in black, a medium told Mrs. Romano that she and her children would die if they didn't move soon. Before selling the beautiful home, the family reached out to the Northeast Ohio Psychical Research Society to investigate. What the team found is unknown, but whatever it was, it was so frightening that one of the investigators ran out of the castle, screaming in the middle of the night. The Romanos also asked the Catholic Church for help, but a priest supposedly refused to bless the house because of some incredibly dark energy he felt once he stepped inside. Sightings of apparitions continued, and a malevolent presence began to be felt inside the home more and more frequently. Strange, eerie sounds were often heard, odd shadows spotted flitting about in the periphery, and finally the Romanos could no longer endure the supernatural occurrences and sold the house to the Muscatello family in 1974. Owner Sam Muscatello would claim to see various apparitions himself, but also to not be afraid of the mansion he'd bought that he firmly reported to be haunted. He sought to turn it into a business by offering tours and inviting the media in for some free promotion. It was reported that during a live radio segment for one of these promotions, radio host John Webster's tape recorder was pulled off of his shoulder by an unseen entity and thrown down a staircase. In January of 1975, Sam Muscatello claimed that he had discovered human bones behind a wall on the second floor. Muscatello told some reporters he was trying to build another secret passage when he found the bones. The identity of the bones or how that individual died remains unknown. Local authorities concluded that the bones were human, most likely belonged to a child, and were quite old. Some have speculated that Sam planted the bones to convince visitors his house was really haunted. Others view the bones as proof of Hannes Tiedemann's evil reputation. Cleveland historian William Creechy, who hosts ghost walks in the area and for six years was the resident historian of Franklin Castle, doubts a lot of this. He told Cleveland Magazine, Around 1980, Tiedemann suddenly became this murderer in the stories. Prior to the 1980s, the house was haunted and that was it. Creechy believes rumors of Tiedemann being a vicious killer didn't begin until after the Cleveland Plain Dealer published an article on March 27, 1980 about a medium who said that they lived in the home and they claimed that Tiedemann's ghost confessed to the alleged crimes. He thinks the medium made all that up. Creechy said the servant girl and Tiedemann's niece never existed, there's no evidence of them in census records, and they never came up during discussions with descendants of the family. However, Creechy does believe the home is very haunted. He just doesn't know who or what is haunting it. He has claimed to have heard footsteps, voices, the radio turning on and off by itself, and a lot more. The Muscatello family, not experienced as much financial success with the house as they'd hoped, eventually decided to sell the castle, and it has gone through multiple owners since. And many of them have also reported experiencing the paranormal. Helen Merketta, who lived in the house in the early 80s, has professed that she endured numerous terrifying encounters with the spirits of Franklin Castle. She claimed she was pushed on the second floor stairs not once but a few times by an invisible force. Uh, Interestingly, she never felt that it was trying to intentionally hurt her. Instead, she felt it was trying to warn her about what she doesn't know. But she believes that she would have encountered something that would have done a lot more than shove her if she hadn't been stopped from proceeding by this spirit. Helen often felt depressed inside the home but didn't understand why. It was as if the depression was not her own and her condition improved greatly as soon as she moved out. Her husband said that he, on several different occasions, heard babies crying inside the walls. He said that he once put a tape recorder in a closet and captured the noises. And when he and Helen played the recording back, not only did they hear babies crying, they also heard an older man's voice screaming at a young girl who sounded very distressed. They moved out when Helen's son was still a toddler, 
because they didn't want him to grow up in a home that they were growing more and more afraid of. In 1985, the home was purchased by musician Mickey Deans. Deans was the fifth and final husband of actress Judy Garland. Mm -hmm. After buying the home for $93,000, he spent over $2 million on renovations. He moved out less than a decade later in 1994. The castle was abandoned from 1994 to 1999 until it was sold to Michelle Heimberger, an early employee of Yahoo whose stock options made her a millionaire overnight in 1996 when the company went public. Michelle had been fascinated by the house since she was a little girl and purchased it with the intent to restore it. Unfortunately, the house was badly damaged by fire in November of 1999. An arsonist broke in, set a series of fires throughout the house, with the largest fire being set in the basement. Firefighters actually found the arsonist unconscious inside the building. When later asked about his motive, he disturbingly told them, I had to burn down the castle. It is pure evil. Michelle still planned to restore the home, but then the restoration was not completed because of some financial setbacks she experienced in the early 2000s. In July of 2003, it was reported that the house was sold to a man who wanted to turn it into a dinner club. Invitations for membership were sent out. The opening was set for May of 2004, but then it never opened. Why? Some think the spirits residing in the house pushed him out. In 2011, a company called Oh Dear Productions, LLC, purchased the house and partnered with a European couple for another massive restoration project that was completed several years ago. Today, Franklin Castle is open to the public for events and overnight stays, and reports of the paranormal do continue. Guests have alleged in recent years to have heard and seen doors opening and closing on their own, disembodied footsteps, objects moving around. Some people have lost their personal items only to find them in a completely different room on a different floor. And a few people have reported seeing one of the following the ghost of a young girl on the third floor, a woman in black on both the third and fourth floor, and a ghostly apparition in white, age and gender unknown, on the stairs. Some people passing by on the sidewalk or street have reported spotting the apparition of a lady in black watching them walk or drive by from one of the windows. The halls and secret passages of Franklin Castle are full of mysteries. Time will tell if any of them are ever solved. We should go. We should go. We should go. Even just like a daytime thing, but yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe I could spend the night. I started to think that I was like, I could spend the night. And then I just, as you were naming, yeah. like, there, I was like, okay, well, I can't stay on the third floor. Well, I can't stay on the fourth floor. Well, I probably can't stay. I mean, it would be. And I was like it, picturing myself yeah, yeah, yeah. being there, seeing something, and just crying and being like, I want to go. I don't know if I can handle it. Pretty cool house, though. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do have some pictures of it. Okay. Yeah. It is so fun to hear like a story from home. Yeah. Just, I was like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. Like, I know so many of these names. Like, Friends with these last names or, yeah. you know, which like descendants, maybe, maybe not, you know, families, family names. Are, it's it's like Smith, you Did know. Did you know any Tiedemanns? Like, uh, well, there's Tiedemann Square, which is. Oh, probably named after him. Yeah. And it's I can like picture where it is. I want to say it's like where Lakewood and Fairview meet. But whatever. It's That's not correct. I know that's not correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I can kind of um, like think about different things like that. Or like, you know, you say little things like, oh, yeah, the plane dealer. Like my mom delivered the paper as one of her oh, yeah. many jobs when she mm-hmm. had like a thousand jobs being a mom. Uh, yeah, just like, but like different little things. It's like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. I know that. Oh, yeah, I know Fun. this. Yeah. yeah. I'm surprised you haven't covered it before, actually. Um, this this uh, first picture, nice exterior uh, photo of Cleveland's Franklin Castle. Yeah, it is really cool. And I think that my dad did point it out to us because when we were last there... Christmas of 22, we stayed in Ohio City. And oh, so yeah. I think that's why it, my dad was talking about it when he came to our Airbnb or something. Uh-huh. Uh, this next one, creepy pick in one of the rooms in the basement prior to the recent renova- uh, renovations. So creepy. I know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this next one, uh, Hannes and Louise Tiedemann with their son, August. This is taken sometime in the 1880s. They all look thrilled. I know. It is funny, those old, what do they call them, tintype or those old photos where they just had to hold still for so long. I know we've talked about it before. Yeah. It took me a long time to realize that was why they didn't smile in these old photos. Yeah, your face would fall. <laughs> right. They just had to hold that position for so long. I just want you to know for a second, I was like, boy, their son looks very feminine. I'm like, that's the wife sitting down. I was oh, thinking yeah, of the yeah, parents yeah. standing and the child in the middle. I was like, uh-huh. huh. I don't remember <laughs> boys dressing like that then. Uh, this next one is a cool nighttime shot of the castle. Mm. Great photo. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Good and, editing on that. And then finally, I wish I could have found a better photo, but this is a, a part of a hallway wall that slides open to reveal a hidden staircase leading to one of those secret passages. Oh, that reminds me of Murders Only in the Building. Oh, yeah. Is anybody watching that? Yeah. It's, what it's, is such it? a, it's such a dumb show. Season two, I think, is where the secret passages are. That's where we are, right? I thought we were in three. Yeah. Season, I thought I thought two. Two or three is where all the secret two passages are. Yeah. 
It's, it's like a, I say it's such a dumb show, meaning like, it feels like the actors on that show just can do whatever they want in, in a fun way where they get to like develop the characters however they want. It just seems like a, a, a cast of who's who, like yeah. just, you know, working with their friends. And it's, it has like these very silly moments. They're not, it's not trying to be scary. Yeah. And so it's just kind of like dumb fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a better way to say it. Oh, well, thanks for taking us back to Cleveland. Uh huh. You know, I'm from there. <laughs> just ask me. <laughs> I was like making notes. I was like, oh yeah, I love this. I love that. Yeah. Westside Market, Ohio City, yeah. Ohio City Brewery. So many fun things. Yeah, so, Westside Market's very cool. Very cool. Yes, yes. At Cleveland, you know, listen, I've said cool it. Cool city. Yeah, it wasn't always. Well, it was, and then it wasn't, yeah. and now it is again. And as I'm always telling people, I'm like, it is one of the last cool, affordable cities to live in. Like, it really is, you know, you can still buy a, a decent house at a decent price. Yeah. And just, just like a very, like, blue-collar place to be. Cleveland rocks. Sure does. <laughs> All right. Well, do you want to dig into fairies? Uh, yeah. Bay Why folk? not? Yeah. I, I, didn't, I can't recall if I've ever told a fairy story. Maybe a long time ago, I feel like we had a submission from a listener in Ireland, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. This one just kind of grabbed me. I've been listening to your podcast voraciously, and I'm nearly caught up. I'm an absolute creeper. Sometimes I listen to your podcast along with my other favorite horror podcast, to soothe me to sleep. Wow. I have I know. I have not yet heard you tell a story of an encounter with a fae of this particular variety. I was raised in a pagan family with Celtic roots and raised to both believe in fairies and to be wary of them. I was taught about all different types of fae folk and the various kinds of mischief they might get up to. One of the big rules about encountering fae folk is to avoid interacting with them at all. And if you do, be very, very careful of what you say. For example, if a fae asks, may I have your name? You must give them a false name or they can steal your identity and become you. They are tricksters by nature and you must be careful that you don't get tricked out of your whole life. That being said, two winters ago, my then girlfriend and I were visiting my parents' home in Rhode Island. During our stay, we had plenty, we had a particularly nice day of weather. I wanted to show my girlfriend the Heritage Park trails as it had been one of my favorite places from my childhood. The weather had been especially nasty that winter, so the trails were still covered in snow and ice. We laced up our boots, donned our snow pants and heavy winter coats, and entered the trails. It was early afternoon when we arrived with only one other car in the parking lot. We opted to take the short loop where we could see the most interesting parts of the trail, but also not be out too long in the cold for too long. Despite the sunny day, it was still the mid middle of winter and it was quite cold. During the first half of the hike, we enjoyed watching my dog eat ice from streams, we threw snowballs at each other, and admired the various evergreens adorned with handmade decorations by various artists. Everything in the woods that afternoon felt especially bright and magical. I felt the wonder of my childhood as I pointed out the best rock climbing areas and secret hiding spots I used to use to win at hide and go seek. The other people we saw, the only other people we saw was an elderly couple with their dogs. We assumed it was their car that had been in the parking lot alongside ours. They were headed back towards the parking lot and we did our polite hellos and little waves as we passed one another and then continued on. Dusk snuck up on us, the light fading to dark despite not having been out that long. We picked up our pace to avoid hiking back on ice in the dark. The last leg of our adventure was on a rather steep hillside peppered with patches of ice. There was an old shepherd's hut along this path. For those that don't know, this is a stone structure with a tiny entryway and an incredibly low ceiling, just high enough to sit upright and a dirt floor. As a kid, this was the spot to play in. Armed with your imagination, you could really have a great time here. When we reached this spot, I excitedly showed my girlfriend inside while my dog happily ran in right after, looking for any snacks previous visitors may have left behind. After a minute or two, we ducked out of the hut and turned to head back down the trail. From here, you can see for a long way, especially in the winter, with no foliage to block your view. At the base of the previously mentioned icy slope, there was now an old woman struggling to climb up the ice. She was dressed in all black. She was incredibly focused on each step she took, taking great caution to place her feet properly. I put my dog on her leash, worried she'd run down towards the woman and possibly startle her off her feet onto the ice. We slowly made our way down the slope, catching, uh, carefully watching our own feet. I kept a concerned eye on the woman as she approached us. 
Seeing her still struggling, I considered calling out to her to see if she wanted some help and to inform her that the entire slope was icy, thinking it might be better for her to take a different route. Plus, the sun was hanging low and dark would soon take what little light was left. I was about to call out to her when I paused. I noticed that this woman was wearing a bright red scarf. Had she always been wearing that? How had I not noticed it before? And, as I now had a better look at her, I could see she was not at all dressed for the weather or this type of hiking. She was wearing leggings, a thin coat, and high-heeled boots like you'd see on someone wearing at a party, not outside on a hiking trail. Looking back upon her face, it changed completely. She was suddenly a young woman, no older than 35. She had a faraway look in her eyes that wasn't exactly here, but wasn't fully somewhere else either. I shut my mouth, no longer wanting to speak to this woman at all. Something in my stomach twisted as we got close to her. She stared at us through her glassy eyes and dazed expression. I momentarily worried she was strung out on drugs or in some other kind of danger where she should definitely not be out in the woods by herself. I quickly glanced at my girlfriend to see if she was picking up on the same feeling. Just one look and her eyes silently told me she was terrified. I moved closer to one side of the trail, keeping my girlfriend on my side farthest from the woman, and I tightened my grip on the leash of my dog. My dog, who normally wants to say hello to every single goddamn person she lays eyes on, had absolutely zero interest in being near this woman. She put herself between my girlfriend and I so as to protect her. The woman was now about to pass us. I gave her a half smile and a little nod. Her glassy-eyed expression shifted. She was looking at me, like really looking at me, and a strange smile crept into her lips. It frightened me to my core. Not wanting to give her any opening for any kind of interaction, I looked away as we shuffled. I kept my head down, my eyes forward, and continued forward, counting to ten, and then glancing over my shoulder. And when I did, I stopped dead in my tracks. She was gone. I scanned the woods besides the trail on either side but saw nothing. No movement, no sounds of footsteps, no red scarf. And then I remembered the hut. I relaxed for a moment, thinking that she must have ducked inside until I remembered again just how slowly she had been previously moving. She would have had to have run up the icy hill without falling, without making any noise, without cracking any ice, to have reached the hut in 10 seconds that it took for me to turn around. As I watched, carefully waiting for her to emerge from the hut, I noticed that she had somehow left no footprints at all either. A chill ran down my back. Did you see where that lady went? I asked. What do you mean? She's just walking up the trail behind us. I know, but look, do you see her anywhere? I thought she would still be close behind us since she was moving so slowly. My girlfriend now scanned the forest and she too saw nothing. My dog started whining at us, wanting to get back to the warmth of the car. Not wanting to totally freak my girlfriend out, I just shrugged it off. We finished our walk in silence, listening only to the sounds of our footsteps and my dog's tags jingling. When we got back to the parking lot, my pickup was the only car there. We piled into the cab and blasted the heat. Hey, can I ask you a question? My girlfriend was now looking at me. Yeah, of course, what's up? I said while rubbing my hands together to warm them faster. When we first saw that woman, did she look really old to you? I stopped rubbing my hands together, that same sour feeling rising up in my stomach. Uh, yeah, but I just thought it was my bad eyesight. She really scared me. Something wasn't right about her. Can we leave? I do not want to see her again. I pulled out of the parking lot quickly and began our journey home. What do you think she was? I asked. A ghost? No, my girlfriend said. I think she was a fairy. I felt compelled to reach out to her to speak to her when she looked elderly. But then suddenly, I swear she changed right in front of me. And I don't think ghosts can do that kind of thing. Plus, she looked way too solid. I was shocked. She saw it and felt it too. It wasn't me just freaking myself out or making something out of nothing. We were both really unnerved by the entire interaction. I have never encountered something like this before. This was not human. It was just something pretending to be. I'm so glad I didn't speak to it. Who knows what could have happened to us if we had. Dylan. Thanks, Dylan. That's kind of fun. Yeah, very, very different story than we normally get. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't don't know a whole lot about fairies. That's not a a part of this world that I've ever explored really at all. Yeah, I, I have, but I can never remember. It's like, for whatever reason, it's like, you know, we all have our favorite parts of like this paranormal world yeah and they've just never been like a big favorite of mine but but it is like interesting mm-hmm. but i but i can't retain a lot of information or i just haven't been able to retain a lot of information because like i'll come across her story so sporadically right and i'm like oh okay that's interesting and it took me a long time to get over like thinking of fairies as basically like um 
a Tinkerbell. Uh huh. You know, <laughs> like that kind exactly, of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And like the 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 actual lore around them is they're not little teeny helpless kind of harmless things no, not at, at all. all. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I forgot that they can like change their appearance, and I think I get them confused sometimes with halflings too, which is I think part of that same Celtic lore. Yeah, I think that like in order to really understand it, we would have to do a deep dive, like week after week. On this particular yeah, yeah, area yeah. because it, it is so, well, it's like we're not Celtic and we didn't grow up around a lot right. of that. So it's not a part of our um, just kind of like whore lore yeah. in the States. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, just for us where we grew up and people we grew around. Uh, but yeah, so I don't really know a whole lot about it at all. But I just thought yeah. it was fun to like throw something else in there yeah. and make it, you know, just another thing that can, I don't know what happens if you do interact with them and they trick you and they take your life. Like what happens to you? Uh, I, I, yeah, I can't, I can't remember. There is like supposedly some rules. I feel like it wasn't that long ago. Now I'm trying to remember, was it a fairy or no, it was a changeling. There was that story from Ireland that I told a while back where the guy, it was so sad actually. Oh my God. Yes. They killed his wife, That's but like right. the whole family was like demanding that like she reveal her true form. That's right. And there was that hill where supposedly yes, they yes. went in. I think that was a changeling though. Oh man, there's so, so many, like, hard. There's so many like pieces of so many stories that float yeah. through my brain every time we tell another story. Yeah. So it's hard to sometimes connect them. Yeah, and in Western and like Northern Europe, all that Celtic Viking stuff, which is all interconnected. Yeah. They're just there is so many creatures in their lore. Mm-hmm. You know, just so many weird, like like in Iceland alone, there's like, I don't know, a dozen or more little elves and fairy type beings that have different, you know, qualities. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to track <laughs> yeah, it all. Yeah. 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 But it was just a, a totally different kind of thing for us. Mm, yeah. yeah. All right. Are you ready for one more? I am. Th- this we're familiar with. We know imaginary friends. Okay. Okay. okay yes, so you, yeah, yeah, you can, you can listen at a more relaxed pace instead of like, oh shoot, what a, what's up with fairies? Yeah. 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 All right. All hail Master Suck and Queen of the Suck. Mm. I'm a fellow creeper and big fan of Time Suck too. Thank you. I'm here to tell you the story of my imaginary friend. I grew up in the country on nine acres of land with a thick forest behind the house. When I was little, maybe four or five, I had what I was told was an imaginary friend. Completely normal for an imaginative little kid, especially one who doesn't have many friends close by. My friend's name was Brianna. She was a pale girl about my age with long black hair, and she always wore an old Victorian style nightgown. Me and Brianna played all the time. We played with my toys and my stuffed animals. She'd color with me and we'd sing songs together. You know, typical imaginary friend stuff. One thing I was always bummed about was that Brianna would never leave the house with me. She always told me she was scared and didn't want to go. I accepted this knowing that she would be waiting for me whenever I did come back. My parents had built their house on a wooded lot in 1993. They eventually cleared out the trees in front of the house and all the way up the road, about a fourth of a mile of field and driveway room. About a fourth of mile of field and driveway. I didn't think much of it then, but occasionally we would get tour buses and groups of people showing up at our house trying to visit the graveyard. I soon learned that we had a very old cemetery behind our house. The graveyard was completely neglected and there was no clear path from our yard to the graveyard. Doc Holliday, the famous Western mm. outlaw, had some family buried in our said cemetery, specifically his grandparents. Wow. My parents didn't know this when they bought the land, and they thought this was a very cool and unique thing. We constantly had to turn away tourists. Plus, the land was overgrown, and we personally didn't feel like doing the work to clear the past for tourists to visit the graves. Comically, though, after doing some research, we found that this wasn't even true, <laughs> as Doc's family was buried in the city over. I have a younger brother who, as he was growing up, made fun of me for having a friend like Brianna. He told me that she wasn't real, that I was crazy. But then one day, we were watching TV in the living room when I heard my CD stereo turn on in my bedroom upstairs. We were the only ones home. My father was at work and my mother had run to the grocery store and I was left to babysit my little brother. I was maybe nine or 10 and although I didn't see Brianna as much anymore, she still came to play occasionally and I knew it was her that was responsible for the music. When we heard the music from upstairs, my brother froze. I smiled and laughed a bit, saying like, oh, it's just Brianna, don't worry. My brother, visibly upset, states, Brianna's not real, you're making it up. Prove it if she's real, like a little kid would. Once again, I smiled and yelled up the stairs, hey, Brianna, can you play some music? Or can you please turn off the music while we're watching TV? And the music stopped abruptly. My brother, clearly freaked out, didn't believe me. He thought I was playing a trick on him. I don't believe you, make her do something else. Being the stubborn older sister I was, I yelled up the stairs once more for Brianna to do something to prove if she was real. 
And as soon as the words left my mouth, we heard a loud crash from my bedroom. We jumped, screamed, and instantly ran upstairs to investigate. In my bedroom, we both saw something we'll never forget. Everything that had been hung on my walls, posters, paintings, pictures, every toy and stuffed animal I owned was all in a pile in the middle of the room. It was as if they were ripped from the walls and out of my toy box and thrown together in a fit of rage. My brother and I took one look at each other before bolting out of the house. We called my mom, crying hysterically, begging her to come home. When she came home, we told her everything that had happened, and of course, she blew it off, telling us that she wasn't in the mood to play games. She made me clean up the mess and then go straight to bed. And that was the last time I would ever talk to Brianna. Years went by with no weird happenings, and Brianna left my mind. But then in 2007, my mom got pregnant with my little sister, Abby. Abby moved into my old room and I moved into the only other bedroom upstairs, across the hall from my old room. Abby had a bunch of baby toys that would light up and sing, walkers, rattles, you know, normal baby stuff. One night, I heard one of her toys start playing a song out of nowhere. It was 2.30 in the morning and Abby was definitely asleep in her crib. No toys available to her. I sat up in my bed, glance out of my open door into her room, and I could see her sleeping quietly when her baby walker lit up in the darkness and began playing a tune. I slowly crept out of bed and tiptoed my way to the door. I took one step into the hallway when the walker slowly began scooting across the floor as if there was a child in it walking, moving it. My stomach dropped. I ran to Abby, grabbed her out of her crib, and ran downstairs where I slept with her in the guest room. The next morning, I told my mom what had happened. She said she never heard a single sound on the baby monitor that night and blamed it on sleepwalking or me having a bad dream. Over the next few years, things like this would happen often. Abby's toys would light up without anyone touching them. Her music books would start singing randomly. We'd hear footsteps upstairs while everyone was in the living room below and so on. Sometimes I'd hear a little girl's laugh come from Abby's room, but it wasn't my sister's laugh. It was nothing evil or malicious, so I accepted the fact that we had a spirit and it was a kind one. Fast forward to my senior year in high school. I was working on a project with a group of classmates where we had to make a short film on one of Edgar Allan Poe's poems. Hmm. Me, wanting it to be spooky, suggested we film it in the graveyard behind my house. I'd never even been back there, but I figured it would be a cool spot. My classmates agreed and came to my house. I had cut a path through the thorns and bushes with a machete while my classmates watched. Mm -hmm. When we finally got to the graveyard, the headstones were extremely damaged. It looked as if an earthquake had rocked the land, but only in this one small area. There were fallen trees that had been uprooted all around the graves, giant slabs of rocks piercing through the ground. We had had some bad tornadoes come through a few years back, and I assumed that this was the resulting damage. We filmed our video with zero issues. There were never any bad feelings or any moments of get the fuck out. After we finished filming, I began looking at the headstones a little bit closer. While most were worn out and unable to be read due to the years of weather and neglect, I did manage to find one. Brianna Williams, Mm -hmm. 1878 to 1883. My stomach was in my throat. It all made sense. I had assumed after all these years that she was a ghost, but this solidified it for me. This was my proof. Years later, I asked my sister if she ever had an imaginary friend when she was little. Oh yeah, her name was Brianna, she told me. My mother has now come to admit that she knew our house was haunted when we were little, but never wanted to scare us. She knew the spirits were peaceful and didn't see any reason to cause panic or for us to even move. In fact, my parents still live in that house today. While there are no young children living there anymore, they do still hear footsteps upstairs and the occasional laugh of a little girl coming from the upstairs bedroom. Courtney. Courtney, that's a great story. Yeah, I thought so too. Mm -hmm. Just really well put together and just all the details that like, you know, the corroborating witnesses, if you will. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. And I I like that little ghost, little five-year-old Brianna, um, you know, with like in in that attached to that one room and then like uh, approached uh, uh, Courtney when she was like, you know, probably around that same age, a little Mm -hmm. older. And then she kind of like grew out of that ghost being... I don't know, for lack of a better word, attracted to her, yeah. drawn, drawn towards her. And then her little sister, Abby, then experiences that. And then they find the tombstone. And then the mom says it's haunted. It all just kind of gets wrapped up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought it was great. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about how creepy it would be if you woke up in the middle of the night. I know exactly what kind of walker thing she's talking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the round white plastic thing. Yep. It has the little seat. And like when the baby's in it, they can slap different things uh-huh, for lights uh-huh. and sounds. If I woke up in the middle of the night and saw one of those moving across a room. Yeah. Oof. Ooh, I don't know how. I mean, she grabbed her sister and ran downstairs. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I, I think I would pass out. 
<laughs> yeah, that'd be terrifying. I'd be so scared. But but she says like as a family, they weren't really freaked out by her. Well, yeah, it doesn't sound like this uh the spirit or you know this presence did anything. No, you know to scare them. Sounds like it was just uh I mean kind of sad really. I know. Uh, little girl stuck somehow at that age and just uh wanting to have a playmate. Hmm. Those stories like that make it, it just seems like the little like the spirit is so sentient. Like yeah. It's, like it's not just a looped echo. Right. You know, it's like it's interacting. It's sharing its name apparently. Yeah. You know, talking to them, playing with them. Yeah, that's, that's super strange. I burned my ear with a curling iron this morning, ah, and I couldn't figure out what like what was going on when I put my in ears in when we yeah. came in to record. And I was like, "Ooh!" Did I cut my ear, and then like halfway through, I was like, "Oh, you burned your ear this morning, you idiot!" Oof! Yeah. And just the way it like rests against it, I have to give up on. I have to be oh, one no. ear. Okay, be one it's ear okay. for a while. Yeah, that's all right. We're we're towards the end. Yeah, we both had a lot of stuff. I mean, I know this morning I um I lost a lot of blood oh my this God. morning, like probably like a couple gallons, and it just left me really. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that's like your go-to. I'm teasing you. I'm spa- that- saying spacey and pasty. I was just teasing about what you said I this morning. I didn't say pasty. I said you looked pale. Uh-huh. Pale, okay. pasty. Well, but in my defense, yeah. oftentimes when you work out, you will say like you felt like you were going to pass out. Yeah. You do have incredibly low blood pressure. And if you don't have enough food to eat before we record, you are spacey. So it's mm-hmm. fair of me to be like, are you yeah. okay? I'm yeah. teasing you. Okay. It doesn't <laughs> seem like it. Oh, boy. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and anything else? No, nope, that's it. Okay, that's our that's our show. Uh, uh, we are going to thank some Annabelles and have some spoopy shout outs and then wrap it up. Sounds good. Do you want to go first? Or do you want me to go first? Uh, you can go first. All right. I'd like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon. Jess Harris, Matthew McLaren, Andrew Poole, L. Bishop, Molly Rowe, Mandy Russick, Misty McClellan. Oh, I think we just read her story last week. Huh. Uh, Jessica... Alatore, Ben Wallace, and Jaden. And I would like to thank the following Annabelles. Yeah, and again, thank you so much for supporting this show. Uh, Shaylin Saltz, Crystal. Uh, cool spelling of Crystal. Haven't seen that one before. K R Y S T L E. Mm. Spoopy Cami. Mm. Uh, Cole Grove. Uh, but one word, Cole Grove. Corey Doyen. Michael White. <laughs> JJ Jabberjaw. <laughs> uh, Tamika Alston. Miguel Santana. And Lisette. There we go. Lisette. Lisette. And then I have a handful of uh, spoopy shout outs to Sasha from Rudy, Ebony, and Aria. Happy 36th birthday. Please sit down and relax for more than five minutes. (laughs) To Kendra from Kendra. Happy 35th birthday. Uh, To Shano from Molly. I think about you and miss you every day. Making music isn't the same without you. I love you. And also, fuck you for dying first. Oh. I know. Okay, and now I am surely going to mess this up because I have studied this much Spanish. To me, Calicito from Tu Pastelito. I'm so lucky I met you. You are my missing puzzle piece, my North Star. Happy birthday. I can't wait to be, uh, oh boy, a viajito with you. <laughs> I, I was like, really? You just have to give me a bunch of English and then throw some Spanish words in there? I looked them all up. And I don't speak Spanish. Well, you sound like you did a good job. I, I know. I looked up. It was like, I think it's like to my little cupcake. Uh, no, to my hot, to my, like, like cafecito is like coffee. Like I looked up. So it's mm. like, just like a cute little inside joke. And pastelito is a cupcake. So I'm like, oh, that's cute. Like to my little. Is cafecito like a little coffee? Like must a small be. coffee? It must yeah. be. I didn't dig that deep. And then viejitos are old men. Mm, okay. So I was like, okay, I get it now. Just yeah, like yeah. little inside jokes. Uh, well, that is our show. Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you, Logan Keith, editing and publishing today's show. Thanks to Heather Rylander, organizing the My Story emails, and to book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. Thank you to producer Molly Jean Box again for finding the first story I told this week, to Olivia Lee for again finding the second. Uh, kind of back-to-back weeks with those uh, those two. We're on YouTube if you want to watch this show. And we're on Facebook and Instagram where we post pics that accompany episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast. We have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, full of fellow horror lovers. And big thanks to the All Seen Eyes, the Creeps and Peepers moderators, uh, who continue to do a fantastic job. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers, and hope you were scared to death. Don't forget to get your camp tickets. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee. 
through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within, scared to death.